welcome to our harvest festival. It's not as we usually have it, but the reason for it is just the same. A few basic rules. Please keep your masks on, please keep socially distant, and after the service, please don't congregate in the vestibule. Now I'd like to welcome Kevin Dobson to lead our harvest festival. It's always good to have Kevin here and to lead our worship, and we look forward to what he has to say. Thank you. Right, I shall formally demask. <laughs> It's not no fun having glasses, is it? <laughs> there's, there's got to be an answer to that somewhere, but I'm, not, I'm, I'm yet to find it. Um, this, this is lovely to be back amongst you. It's a bit strange, isn't it? Uh, but then again, life is a bit strange, isn't it? Um, who would have thought, coming into this year, that we would be where we are now? But we are, and we're here, and it's uh, fabulous to be amongst you. Um, if you don't like this morning, it's your own fault, because you invited me. <laughs> um, now, Margaret, was that last year, or was that even the year before? I don't know. I, I think it may well have been two years ago, and I couldn't do it last year, so we, this, is, this has been a long-standing arrangement. So uh, it's absolutely lovely to be here. Um, yeah, you know, how very strange. Um, the tripod is because we're, I'm recording the service um, to go out to our Methody congregation this week. Um, we're having a pre-recorded service this week, so I thought, well, I'm delivering a service, so why don't we do this? So, morning, Methley, good to see you all. Um, you are not on camera, don't worry, it's on camera, so you can relax. Um, if you want to say anything libelous, just be aware that it's going to go out of um, Right, so, yes, here we are, uh, the very strangest of harvest festivals, but a harvest festival nonetheless. The call to worship is a quote that I found from uh, a guy called Lincoln Pats, and he said this, Before the fruits of prosperity can come, the storms of life need to first bring the required rains of testing, which mixes with the seeds of wisdom to produce a mature harvest. So we're going to sing. I'm going to uh, do two songs this morning while well, I'm going to sing. I believe that's within the guidelines, but sadly all you can do is listen. <laughs> tap your feet, yeah. You can absolutely tap your feet. I, I would imagine in your little bubble where you are, dancing is allowed and permitted and even encouraged. So, uh, yeah.
Margaret Dodd to thank for my knowledge of that hymn. There's only a few I've never heard of it before. And it's a lovely hymn, a very powerful song. Um, and yeah, really, really great message. <laughs> Let's come together in prayer. Let's pray. Lord God, however odd this all feels, it is good that we can be here to come to praise and worship you with a common purpose. We come to celebrate an annual festival, the Harvest Festival. When we think of your creation, the gifts that we receive as a result, the generosity and hard work of so many people. who we'll think on those things today. Lord, we'll never really understand you and that's okay. Instead, let us come to this place and to this act of worship with a spirit of openness and acceptance and a sense of wonder. Let us leave our preconceptions at the door and come and be open to what you have to say to us this morning. Wherever we find ourselves in our lives, there's always a chance of something fresh and something new coming into our lives. When Jesus came to the earth, he brought something fresh and something new and often something that people simply couldn't grasp. But his message of love was unavoidable. And help us please, Lord, to just get a sense of that today, a taste of that message of love. And we hope that we can carry that message of love with us as we leave here today. In the peace and quiet of this moment, Lord, let us think about ourselves and we've come in here today and brought all manner of stuff with us. It may not be visible, but the baggage and the burdens that we carry in our minds and in our souls are there. In this time, we can just spend a quiet time with you. We know you know all about these things. We know you want to hear us talk about them. So we bring you our worries and our fears and our guilt. We bring you the troubles and burdens that we carry. We bring you the regrets that we have. We bring you the thoughts we have about the times when we know we got it wrong and that others maybe ended up hurt as a result. We bring you the hurt that we have, that others may well have caused us. But here in this place, in this sanctuary, in this moment with you, it's okay to share and think on these things. And we bring them to you and you are there with a longing and a desire to share our burdens. So we offer ourselves in this moment wholeheartedly to you and your love. Harvest is a time of thanksgiving and we come to give thanks this morning for all the tangible stuff that we hold, with all the goodness and love that we have in our souls. We thank you, Lord, for all that you have been to us to get us to where we are today. We thank you, Jesus, for your presence with us right here and now because you love us all so much. And we thank you for the amazing promise we have for the future with you by our side. We ask all of these prayers in Jesus' name. Amen. Let's all share together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, Hallowed be thy name, thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive 
those who trespass against us, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory, for ever and ever. Amen. One of the strangest things for me is standing in one place. I'm not used to that. <laughs> Um, the, I've got a reading this morning, which is one of the lectionary readings, um, and it's from the letter to the Philippians, the first chapter, and verses 21 to 30. So this is Paul speaking. He says, For to me, living is Christ, and dying is gain. If I am to live in the flesh, that means fruitful labour for me, and I don't know which I prefer. I'm hard-pressed between the two. My desire is to depart and be with Christ, for that is far better. But to remain in the flesh is more necessary for you. Since I'm convinced of this, I know I will remain and continue with all of you for your progress and joy in faith, so that I may share abundantly in your boasting in Christ Jesus when I come to you again. Only live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ, so that whether I come and see you or am absent and hear about you, I will know that you are standing firm in one spirit, striving side by side with one mind for the faith of the gospel, and are no way intimidated by your opponents. For them, this is evidence of their destruction, but of your salvation. And this is God's doing, for he has graciously granted you the privilege not only of believing in Christ, but of suffering for him as well, since you are having the same struggle that you saw I had, and now here that I still have. Amen. That was one of the lectionary readings. I'm going to give you a snippet from the others. There was a bit of a theme developed, I noticed. So, from Exodus chapter 16, uh, one of today's readings says this, The whole congregation of the Israelites complained against Moses and Aaron in the wilderness. The Israelites said to them, If only we had died by the, by the hand of the Lord in the land of Egypt, when we sat by the flesh pots and ate our fill of bread. For you have brought us out into this wilderness, to kill this whole assembly with hunger. A verse from Jonah, chapter 3. But this was very displeasing to Jonah, and he became angry. He prayed to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, this is not what I said while I was still in my own country. That's why I fled to Tarshish at the beginning. For I knew that you are a gracious God and merciful, slow to anger and abounding in steadfast love and ready to relent from punishing. And then from the Gospel story this morning, from Matthew's Gospel, it's this parable of the workers in the vineyard. Verse 11 in chapter 20 says this, And when they received it, they grumbled against the landowner, saying, These last worked only one hour, and you've made them equal to us who have borne the burden of the day and all of that scorching heat. Did you get the thing? Everyone's having their eye of grump this morning. <laughs> Moaning and complaining and anger. Yeah. And then I thought, okay. There's a lot of moaning and complaining and anger going on at the moment. Just turn on the news. I, I, I have developed news overload. I, I, I can't watch it anymore um, because it kind of gets me down a bit too much. And there's just this kind of sense developed in the last few months. I, I mean, I've always been a big fan of the BBC, but I think even the way BBC are reporting things these days is more in line with some of the others, if you like. And there's this. There's this sense that they need to make a drama when there isn't really a drama there to make. Um, 
So, some of the things I'm, I end up getting angry watching people complain, and so I think I need to just stop watching people complain, but there's a lot of it going on. This whole thing about foreign holidays, um, you know, we've not, we were due to see Emma in Denmark, we were due to go the week of lockdown, so that clearly didn't happen, and quite frankly, we don't know when we're going to see her again, and that's not easy. But I ain't moaning and complaining about it to anybody, it's nobody's fault, it just is the way that it is. And then on the news, we've got this continuing cycle now where they say it, uh, people go off on foreign holidays and then the government announces that they've got to isolate and so the news people go and interview them and they're having their right all morning. And I think, well, I'm sorry, didn't you think about that before you went? I, I mean, we, we've known since about March or April that if you were even going to get the chance to go abroad, I mean, you might get stuck there. I mean, that, that, that would come as no surprise to anybody. But we've got people literally just moaning and moaning and moaning, saying this isn't fair, when surely they knew that was what the situation was before they went. This whole business with the schools has just been alarming. We, we just seem to be pitting people against one another. And yes, of course, there are polarised and opposing views on the whole thing. But part of this business is about the news coverage. So. I, on one day, the, the news reporter went to a school when the kids were starting to go in. There was a couple of kids there and they got them to interview. And frankly, you'd think they might have screened them first, but they said, so how devastated are you to be turning up at school this morning, kids? And the kids went, this is brilliant. I've been waiting for ages to come back to school. I love it. And the news reporter's going, oh no, that's not what you're supposed to say. Yes, but aren't you frightened? Uh, no. And, uh, and it, was, it was really quite cringeworthy because it, it Clearly, the, the news people had an agenda, and they wanted people to complain and moan about it. So, they, and the kids were more far, and all right, there are other kids that are frightened. You know, this this has polarised us all. I absolutely get that. But there was just this sense that we we had to come up with something to moan and complain about. Don't get me wrong; I can moan and complain with the best of them. But I like to think that it's a bit more constructive than just moaning because things aren't going my way. I like to moan and complain when I see injustice and I see things that are going wrong and I see decisions that I think could have been better. I like to think that, and maybe the people listening to me think that I'm not being very constructive, but I like to think that I am. Um, I, I, I was utterly, utterly, and this, this will may polarise people as well, utterly aghast at the number of complaints that went into ITV and the night that diversity did that dance on Britain's Got Talent. Now I watched the dance, and I'm no fan of dance, uh, but I thought what they did was really, really powerful. And there's, there, you know, we, regardless of where you stand on the issue, we clearly have got an issue, especially in America, where the police are killing people because they're black. That can't be right. And so I can never get upset at anybody campaigning about that. So the whole Black Lives Matter thing, for me, I think is really important. And how, how on earth could you not, in my opinion, not have this mind that, yes, of course a black life matters, and then people try and counter it with, well, all lives matter, and, and off it goes. But anyway, 15,000 people rang ITV to complain. And as you, when you look at the complaints, the thing was, oh, oh, oh well, what, why is it a problem? Well, I, um, I don't want politics on a Saturday night. You know, it, clearly it was just as if they had to really do to examine themselves about the real reason why they were made to feel uncomfortable by watching that. But off these complaints went, I was delighted to see that both ITV and Ofcom have completely decided that there's no action to be taken. But it's rah, 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 and complain and complain and complain. And then we've got the media trying to make it worse, and it just gets me down a little bit. So I end up just having to switch off because I can't take it anymore. And then I may go back to it. And so we've got that, and we've got. Um, all these, these, these excerpts in this, these lectionary readings this morning, we've come to a harvest festival and you look at the lectionary uh, readings and it's full of people having a right old moan and a complaint and God because they're not happy with their lot. I mean the idea that the Israelites could say we, we could have died at home, you didn't have to bring us here to die. Uh, anyway, what's all that got to do with harvest? I can hear you asking. Um, so I am coming to that, I promise. Um, there's kind of <clears throat> two angles to harvest that I can see and feel in my heart today. And number one is my car boot runneth over. 
Uh, we've just loaded up from reception and uh, on behalf of CAP I'm here to say thank you. Um, that's a traditional feature of our harvest festivals where we all go buy or pull from the ground or uh, go out and get all these wonderful resources and put them to good use and boy I can guarantee that they will be put to good use. Um, we, Cynthia was just asking me beforehand, at CAP we, we never stopped, we were always called an, ex an exception in terms of any of the businesses that needed to close during lockdown uh, because we were providing food and drink to the homeless so we've managed to stay up, we've been socially distant since Monday the 23rd of March completely relayed the, the, the centre out. We had to have a lot less people in at any one time, even though we're still getting a lot of people turning up. People are coming for a bit, a bit less time, but they're coming and they're getting help. And at, at the last count, which was a couple of weeks ago, I was off this week, in 23 weeks, I think, of lockdown, uh, we'd fed 7,500 meals to 455 people. So I'm glad we stayed open. There are 455 reasons why it was the right decision to keep that centre open. They're attending at a rate of about 70-ish per day. Um, and so there's still a really big need out there. And we can already see the signs that we better brace ourselves for what's coming. We, we've all seen the economic reports, the situation with unemployment. It's absolutely inevitable in a situation like this. And so you can just see more and more people needing to get into difficulty. So on behalf of the organisation and the staff and volunteers and the trustees, thank you. Because without people and organisations like yourselves, we can't operate. It's as simple as that. And it brings it into a focus today because we're specifically thinking about gathering and giving and putting to good use, deploying. And in so many ways, I mean, seven and a half thousand meals in six months, that's a lot of hot meals. And the hot meals are crucially important, of course they are. The absolute bare sustenance that a meal provides is clearly very important. But it's probably just the vehicle to allow us to connect with these people and talk to them and understand their situation and help them take their next step and encourage them to start caring for themselves again and all that stuff that goes on and so the meal is vital but in many ways the meal is the vehicle to do the real work which is to start to really connect with people and help them to help themselves and it, it's an overwhelming thing to be involved in and I mean I you know, you, you guys have always given in all, I've been there over seven and a half years now and there's, a, there's, a, there's always been a supply coming from here and it's so beautiful to see that that's still going on even in these very strange circumstances. So thank you all, it really does mean a lot. And in some ways this starts to lead me into my second angle on harvest. Um, there's a quote by a guy called Carl Bard which I've used at CAP very often. Um, and it says this, although no one can go back and make a brand new start, anyone can start from now and make a brand new ending. So we have people whose lives have gone hideously wrong in some situations, horribly wrong. But we thrive on the fact that there is always the chance to start to realign ourselves and start to make good choices about taking the rest of our life to a new direction. And frankly, that is no different for anybody. You don't have to be a disadvantaged cap client for that to apply. To, it applies to all of us. We can't go back and change what happened, but we can always start from now and make a new ending and start to look at our choices. That's the important angle for Harvest for me. We're harvesting ourselves, kind of all the time, and, and the Harvest Festival for me brings that into focus. To allow us to look at ourselves and our lives and evaluate the choices that we're making, and wonder and hope and try to go on and be making a positive difference for the people around us, as well as for ourselves. 
The whole harvest cycle is about planting seeds and then nurturing that growth and then harvesting. And then it's the deployment, isn't it? It's doing something with the stuff that you harvest. And when you think about that from a personal point of view, yes, it makes obvious sense from a grain and from a plant, but when you think about that from a personal point of view, it's quite compelling and it's challenging, but it's right that we should. <laughs> what does this harvest time, especially in these strange circumstances, mean for us? For as people and as the choices that we're making. What are the seeds that we're planting? What are the seeds that are planted within us? How are we nurturing those, the growth of those seeds? And when we harvest, what are we doing with the result? What are we doing with our time and our resources and our skills and our talents to make a difference? It's more important, kind of, in this circumstance than ever because we're thrust into a situation that nobody alive has experienced before. If you go back to last year's Harvest Festival and somebody walked in here and said, just to let you know, next September we're going to have the place looking like this and you'll all be wearing masks and you'll have... Okay. No way. No way. We're in a very strange time. But always, if we go back to that quote, no one can go back and make a new start, but anyone can start from now and make a new ending, even in these very strange times. So if it's about us and our choices and what we do, now we're back to the link of our moaning, because we can just stand and moan if we want, but is it productive? Does it make a difference? Or does it just annoy? Does it make somebody just turn off because it's just moaning for the sake of moaning? Ruth Bader Ginsburg, the US Supreme Justice who's just died recently, working right up until her death, she said, fight for the things that you care about, but do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Now there are wise words. There are things that we should be angry about when we see injustice, when we see people being badly treated, when we see people being ignored and sidelined. There are things we should be angry about. But there's a massive difference between moaning and standing up for what's right. Do it in a way that will lead others to join you. Have that radar to know that you're turning somebody off. Paul, in, on the face of it, a more pessimistic view uh, about dying, etc., in this reading this morning, there's a nugget right in the middle of that verse when he's talking to the Philippians. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. In every choice we make, every choice we make, in terms of what we say, what we do, how we react, what we shout about, what we laugh about. Every choice we make should be tested against that. Live your life in a manner worthy of the gospel of Christ. I just read a book. Now, if anyone that knows me well, knows how big a statement that is. I know people who have read more books this September than I've read in my entire life. I've always regretted it. I've all, I've a, I'm a terrible reader. What happens? I open up a book, I start reading, and then I think, I stopped listening to this about three pages ago, and I've been thinking about all sorts of other things. So I find actually one of the ways that I can do it more successfully is an audio book. I, I can listen better than I, than I can read. I've always been ashamed and annoyed that that was the mountain way that I was, so I've hardly read any books at all. Um, but I've just read a book, it was recommended to me by uh, Lorna Ricks, a book called The Midnight Library by a guy called Matt Haig, and I would thoroughly recommend it. Um, it's, there's, there's kind of a, a, a link to our lives because Matt, Matt was suicidal at one point, I've read something else by him, and I don't know, many of you may know, my brother committed suicide about 18 months ago now, and so suicide's become something that's in much sharper focus in our lives. 
And this book is quite phenomenal. It, it talks about that little period uh, between death and dying, if that makes any sense, in that there's a chance to reevaluate your life and think about, well, what if? What if I'd done this? What if I'd done that? What if I'd not chose to go there? What if I'd made a different decision? And it's a great examine. I won't go any further because I don't want to ruin it for you if you want to read it, but I would recommend it. It's a phenomenal life affirming book where we think about the life that we do have and the choices that we make. And it is never too late to start to make different choices in our life. And start to make choices that mean we might just live a glimmer of a life that is worthy of the gospel of Christ. So I want us to think about harvest in those terms today. We're the ones that are being harvested. The choices we make are the rewards and the production from that harvest. And our choices can be positive or negative, can be constructive or passive, can be, but they will always be influential. Every choice we make will influence the people around us. Sometimes, whether we like it or not, sometimes in ways that we'd prefer not. But they will. The choices we make make a difference whether we like it or not. So this harvest, let's have a think. What are we going to do next? I'm going to sing again. Have I not done this before? It's now just gone half an hour. Do, do, do I get shot or tasered if I go past the ground? I'll keep going. faiths 
and cultures. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord God, we're grateful for all that you have provided and thank you for your gifts. We ask for your help in loving others as we love ourselves by sharing what we have widely. Lord, in your mercy, Amen. hear our prayer. Sustaining God, as we look at the food donations, we ask you for your shelter on those without homes and security. Please bless the gifts we've brought this morning and all who will be nourished, both physically and emotionally, when it is distributed. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Holy Spirit, we ask for your love on the works, talents, and skills we all brought here today. We ask for your strength as we work. Lord, in your mercy, yeah. hear our prayer. Jesus, you tasked us all with making disciples. This is our Christian harvest for you. We ask for your guiding hand upon our lives and all of those who we meet this week. Help us grow your church and bring in your harvest. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Amen. <clears throat> right. Thank you for inviting me, for having me. I really enjoyed being here. Um, and yeah, I hope to see you again soon. Maybe things will look a bit different too, knows? It's been great to be with you this morning. Can we close by sharing the grace together? May the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ the love of God and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with us all.